and I just started the recording on Zoom. So um, we will get things started here in just a sec when we see whether or not the Facebook Live works. All right, I think we're live, we'll see. Uh, welcome everyone, thank you for joining us for day two, day two. Rain Gardens 101, Get Your Lawn a Job. Uh, I'm your host today, Matthew Bertrand with Friends of the Rouge, and I'm joined today by Laura Edwards, Friends of the Rouge's Membership and Development Coordinator, who will be helping with your questions towards the end of the event today. Thank you so much for joining us for day two of the event. And just like yesterday, I'm gonna start you all off with my blatant teasers. We did advertise door prizes for your participation today. Those door prizes are a 55 gallon rain barrel in a color of your choice, black, green, gray, red, or blue, not pictured. And also a uh, consultation, a virtual rain garden coach with me uh, for your home, which I deeply look forward uh, to doing with you. Uh, so those are our teasers at the end of today's event you'll see the link for where you can uh, sign yourself up for that through the uh, workshop evaluation. So stay tuned for that. And that'll be something that is open until September 2nd. So if you're watching this live or if you're watching it through a recording later on, you're welcome to be a part of it. All right, moving forward. So yesterday we talked about rain gardens, the what, the why, and the where. Today we're going to get into sizing and digging of rain gardens. And then tomorrow we'll come back one more time to talk about plants, and we'll have a panel of Master Rain Gardener volunteers, real people like you, unlike people like me who uh, obsess over these things and uh, build rain gardens every day. Real people like you um, who've gone through the experience of designing and building a rain gardener at their own home. So you'll be able to ask them all the questions that you want. So for today, a uh, little bit about Friends of the Rouge first. Friends of the Rouge has, uh, was founded in 1986 through the inaugural Rouge Rescue, where we pulled tires, uh, shopping carts, cars, all manner of things out of the river with thousands of people. Uh, our mission is to restore, protect, and enhance the Rouge River watershed. And we do that through education, restoration, and collaborative efforts. Um, so thank you for being here today. We invite you to further explore the river with us in the future. Um, we're gonna be doing our annual kayak trip coming up and uh, we've got a Rouge Un cruise going on right now. Great way for you to get virtually out on the river uh, and that'll be next Tuesday. And then we invite you to restore your river with us, whether it's through building a rain garden at your own home, one of the best things you can do, or if it's joining us when it's safe at a future public event. Thank you very much for joining us. And today's event is also brought to you by Pure Oakland and Water and the City of Southfield. So our enormous thanks to those organizations for making today happen. And this event is also supported by the Master Rain Garden Program with uh, Washtenaw County Water Resources. So thanks to our sponsors, uh, and I hope you'll give them uh, your applause as well. All right, well, we're going to start off with a quiz. I know you didn't think there was going to be a quiz, but there's going to be a quiz, a recap from yesterday, just to catch everybody up briefly on the what's, the why's, and the where's of rain gardens. Um, and I'll do my best to uh, mark you right or wrong, uh, virtually using the powers of my imagination. Uh, I know Oh, I know what you're thinking. Um, so question one, what's a rain garden? So you've got two seconds, go, no pressure. All right, all right, you're correct, good job. So a rain garden is a shallow basin, three to six inches deep or so, um, as demonstrated by our young volunteer here, into which we send water, runoff water, whether it's from our roof, from our driveways, from sidewalks, from parking lots, from roads, all of those hard surfaces. We send that water to this garden where it soaks into the ground and it helps to create habitat. It helps to solve problems with flooding. Beautiful, beautiful gardens. Here's a little schematic showing the water coming from the roof into the garden where it's stored and that's filtered and cleaned um, as the water goes back into our groundwater, um, replenishing our river systems and our lakes. Here is a picture of a rain garden in action. You can see the water coming in from a downspout from the distance uh, and then flowing into this garden where it pools. Um, the water is gonna be there for a maximum of 48 hours before it soaks into the ground. What are the benefits for a rain garden? All right, that's your second question. So go ahead and think about it. You got, again, two seconds. All right. I know you got them all. Uh, here's one that we uh, talked about a bit last time. So ice on the sidewalk, common problem, right? Our downspouts 
outlet right by our sidewalks, the water pools and freezes in the winter time. Terrible problem. And then poor folks walking by, they slip, they fall, they lose their slurpees. It's terrible. So when we build our rain gardens to soak the water up in our lawn, we get our lawn a job, we solve common problems like this. Other benefits of rain gardens, we talked about the flooding issues common on our roads and our rivers across our communities and how we're striving for that thousand rain garden goal uh, to solve these water problems and how focusing on just your home, one part of the overall equation, you can do your part building a rain garden, planting a tree or two, that's about it. It's really not that much. It's not that hard. But when we all do it together, when we strive for that thousand rain garden goal by 2025, we make an enormous difference for our river and in our community. Uh, lastly, we talked yesterday about native plants, about their special value supporting native insects like the monarch butterfly caterpillar. That relationship between that caterpillar and that um, milkweed plant is uh, what underlies so much of the wildlife that lives around us. We talked about how it's not just monarchs, that other caterpillars also depend upon specific plants, native plants, and that when we plant those native plants in our rain garden, we're supporting that life around us. We're supporting birds with those caterpillars. 95, or songbirds rely on uh, about 95% insect feed to support their nestlings. So when we plant native plants in our rain gardens, we're supporting those birds. We're supporting the native bees and the pollinators around us. Um, we're doing so many wonderful things with our rain garden. Lastly, a few other things. There is, of course, the karma factor, right? You're doing a wonderful thing at home, and you're becoming a member of a community of master rain gardeners, of rain gardeners who are making a difference. Um, we're making beautiful spaces for children to explore, planting beautiful plants and supporting wildlife. So many benefits to a rain garden. All right, without further ado, I'm going to get into day two's um, topics. So we're going to start with sizing today. We're going to talk about sizing, we'll do a little bit of styling, and then we're going to talk about digging our rain garden. Then you'll just be all set for next time when we talk about plants. And I hope, I hope that after yesterday that you were able to get out with that tasty beverage and uh, explore your yard to try to pick a spot. Um, so I hope you've got a spot in mind in your yard where you're thinking maybe about having a rain garden so you can sort of follow along with the sizing activities today. All right, so how big should this garden be? And I'm gonna actually let's move my picture. I'm covering up a few things. So the rule of thumb, it's the 20% rule, all right? So what you need to do is you need to figure out what is the area of your roof or the other hard surface that's gonna be draining to your proposed rain garden. Um, once we have that area, then we're gonna have a sense for the rain garden itself. So for example, say you're connecting to this pink downspout right here, and you've got this section of roof draining to it. Great, so that area is gonna be the information that we need to know. Or maybe you know, you're using this area of roof going to this downspout or to this downspout on the other side. So figure out what downspouts are gonna to go to your garden and what the area of roof is that's gonna to go to the garden, and then we can figure out how big the garden should be. Um, I'm gonna teach you about the 20% rule today, and typically the garden is gonna be six inches deep with that 20% rule. So here is a, an aerial view of, of that home um, with the downspout going to the garden. And so there's that section of roof area right there. So that's what we wanna measure. We wanna measure that section of roof. And let's see, I'm gonna give you a demonstration of it right now of an easy way to do that. So I'm gonna get you all into Google Maps for a bit and we are gonna zoom in uh, to a random house. Uh, let's, let's go up here, let's see what we find. And uh, we will do a test on just uh, whatever the first house that I find is. It could be your house maybe, I hope it's your house. Here's one right here, this one looks good. Uh, so I'm gonna zoom in on this house right here. We've got a nice open patch of lawn right here. It looks like there's a tree, but this looks like a spot where we could potentially have a rain garden. We could potentially actually add on to this existing bed right here. That looks like that'll be about 10 feet away from the house. So it'll mesh nicely in. And so what we wanna do is we wanna figure out those downspouts. I obviously don't know the downspout area, um, but I'm gonna guess, you know, it looks like we've got an arc to our roof right here that this area right here probably drains to a downspout right there. So if you right click on Google Maps, you can do measure distance, and then you can click and basically trace the area to give you a quick rule of thumb. So 140 square foot down there, it says, uh, is the ballpark size of that section of roof. That's gonna be my guess as to what would go to the garden right there. So that's your you know, quick, easy way to measure areas in your home. Uh, and then that information is gonna be what tells us the size of the garden. So 20% of that area is what we tend to work with. So for that 140 square foot area of roof, 20% of that would be 
10% would be 14, would be 28. So about 30 square foot. So a pretty small rain garden, about three foot by 10 foot would be a good size to manage that section of roof. Uh, and a ballpark about six inches deep would be good to go. All right, so that is our rule of thumb for sizing, oops, sizing our rain gardens. Uh, and here's another rule of thumb for you. Typically for most sections of roof, about as big as a parking space. Um, parking spaces are about 200 square foot. Um, and so based on what most people's downspout contributing areas is, that area of roof tends to be about as big as a parking space. Good rule of thumb. The thing about this sizing rule is it means you can have very, very tiny, tiny rain gardens that are wonderful. So just to give you an example here, this is Mallory Wilczewski's uh, home in Ann Arbor. She's a master rain gardener. And this little strip right here uh, is actually a rain garden and it's perfectly functional. You can see this little stretch of patio that she's got. And that little strip of rain garden, that's about 20% of the size right there. And so there's no such thing as a rain garden that's too small or too big, really. The smallest garden I've seen is about three square feet. So just taking a very, very small impervious area, hard area, and managing the water from that. Or you can have a rain garden that's very, very big as well. But for you at home, I recommend, again, the smallest rain garden that you can build for your first time for practice is the way to go. Make it as easy on yourself as possible. All right, so that 20% rule though, there's some variation in that. So the key is gonna be what are your soils like? So if you've got clay soils on one extreme or if you've got sandy soils on the other extreme, you might see some variation of that. Um, so if you've got heavy clay soil especially, you're gonna to wanna to make the garden a little bigger. The, the principle is to spread the water out so that it sinks in the ground, spread and sink. And on clay soils, the water soaks in pretty slowly. And so we wanna spread it a little bit bigger. And we're also gonna make the garden only three inches deep on clay, so a much shallower garden. That helps us to make sure that the garden isn't gonna have standing water in it for too long a time, so we avoid the mosquito problem. And it also helps to make sure that your plants are gonna be able to survive. So if you've got that one extreme of clay soil, 30% size and a three inch depth. If you're on the other extreme with crazy sandy soil, and believe it or not, uh, there are people that are blessed with this here in the Rouge River watershed, then you can make the garden much smaller, as small as even 10%, and you can go much deeper potentially in that garden. And you can really plant just about whatever you wanna plant. We're not gonna talk too much about planting yet, but if you've got crazy sandy soil, the water drains so quickly typically that drought is actually often the problem that you're dealing with rather than water. Um, so, Rules of thumb, how do you figure out what your soils are? So there's a couple of options I'm gonna share with you today. So one is a digital tool that we have at the rouge.org slash map. I'm gonna pull it over for you now to see. And uh, we're gonna zoom in a little bit. So this is a mapping system that I made uh, with, I think, support actually from Pure Oak and Water, uh, if I'm remembering properly. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of information on it, really too much information. Um, on the left side here, we can control what information is showing. I'm gonna hide a few things. Um, and let's just kind of zoom in, zoom in a little bit closer and see what we find. You can see river systems drawn on here right now. Um, I wanna show you one cool thing if I can find it. Why can't I find it now? Oh, there we go. There's a very light orange line there. I'm gonna click on that. Oh, no, nope, that's actually the community boundary. Uh, why can't I find one? There we go, there we go. So this that I've highlighted right now, these are ghost streams. So these are streams that were in the Rouge in 1908 on old maps, but they're now gone. So this is a really fun piece of information. If you're on here, you might discover that maybe there was an old stream near your house um, and maybe that's impacting your home. So there's a wealth of information on here. The thing I'm gonna point out to you though, is that I've got soils information on here. And so this can give you a, a little bit of a rule of thumb about what your soils might be like. And um, it's not as readable as I would like it to be, unfortunately, um, but it gives you a ballpark idea. So I clicked on the purple area here. You can see it's somewhat poorly drained and it's got an A slash D. This is an A, B, C, D system. So A is good. That D though, the purple means potentially a high water table. Uh, let's give you another bit of information. Let's try this one here. So this one is A, so good soils, and it says well-drained. So if you live in this area with this color, you likely have that crazy sandy soil that means you can do a much smaller rain garden. So depending on where you live, there's some information on this system that might help give you an idea 
for what your soils might be like. It's always best to verify though, because this is, this is data coming from the federal government and it's not always correct on the site scale. And especially a lot of the high water table areas that are identified um, aren't really that, uh, aren't too big of an issue for a rain garden. Um, but it just gives you an idea for things to watch out for. So that's a resource that you can use to learn more about your soils. The next thing you want to think about doing is a soil percolation test. And um, there are tons of videos on the internet about how to do this, so I'm not going to belabor it today. But the core idea is basically you dig about an 18 inch hole with a shovel, you fill it up with water, you let it drain, then you fill it up again, and then you time how long it takes for the water to drain. And if it drains slower than about a quarter inch an hour, you're probably gonna wanna do that clay rain garden sizing. If it drains at a quarter inch an hour or faster, then you should be good to go with that 20% sizing. Um, so this again, I, I don't expect you to figure out how to do this from what I just shared with you today. So if you decide you wanna do this, the internet will give you some advice. Our website, the rouge.org slash rain smart will also have guidance on how to do this in the master rain gardener training manual. The last thing Thing is a soil boring and this is something if you hire me for a consultation I can do this at your home I dig down basically six to eight feet at your home we look at the soil texture and we look for water the groundwater table and this can give us useful information if you've got just a post hole digger you could also do it that way to just dig down and see what you find the value of this is sometimes what we find is clay on top and then sand right underneath it so potentially you could dig your garden down a little bit deeper and tap into faster draining soils uh, it's rare that I I find that to be honest, but it does happen sometimes. All right, so those are some resources to help you figure out your soil that will help you then figure out your sizing. But barring any of this information, that rule of thumb, the 20% rule of thumb generally tends to work for most people. Um, because the reality is oftentimes it just has to be as small as it needs to be. Uh, on the left here, this is showing some of the just postage stamp houses in some of the urban areas here in Southeast Michigan. I think that might be Dearborn, might be city of Detroit, I forget. Oftentimes we have these teeny, teeny, tiny green spaces and big roof areas that are draining to them. If you're in that situation, that does not mean you can't do a rain guard. Even if you can't hit my 20% sizing, you can probably make it work. The key in such a situation is the plan for overflow. Your garden is gonna get so much water, it's overflowing. And so this picture uh, shows an example of a very nicely armored overflow. You can see the Michigan boulders that are lined where the water is gonna overflow here. That's gonna prevent erosion. And we're also making sure the water is gonna overflow away from our home. So that's gonna be the key if you're gonna be doing an undersized garden. The other key is, especially if you've got clay soils for an undersized garden, plant it before you send the downspout to it. Let those plants establish for three months at least, getting their roots kind of in the ground and ready. That makes them much better able to survive a, a lot of water coming on them. Um, so those are your rules of thumb if you need to make the garden smaller than the guidelines that I'm giving here. All right, moving ahead. So styling, we're gonna spend a very brief amount of time on styling your rain garden. Um, you could spend years learning about designing and styling gardens, uh, but I'm gonna give you some rules of thumb that will help you uh, with very little thought or effort get a garden that's gonna look pretty good for most people. Um, so the rule number one for you, shaping a garden to make it look good is aiming on the side for strong, clean lines. So look at this, a nice circular arc rather than squiggles. We want to avoid squiggles. It's very easy for people to try to, oh, I want to make this really fun, complicated shape. And the reality is for most people, that strong, clean line is going to look much better. And here I've got a picture showing an example for how you can get a nice string line with a stake in the ground, a string attached to it. And then if you've got some uh, marking spray paint from a hardware store, you can just mark a nice clean line that way. Get you a great shape and then you can use your shovel to dig it out. That kind of strong, clean line is going to look wonderful for most people. And it doesn't have to be a perfect circle. You can try to connect a couple of these strong clean lines together in a kidney shape is sort of the default that most people end up doing, whatever shape you want to do. Um, but I would just try to avoid having it kind of squiggly in appearance. Next, uh, it's nice to respond to existing forms. Uh, and that's a bit of a mouthful. I'm going to explain what I mean by that. But first, this uh, picture right here is showing 
uh, a house that's actually really hard to design, right? It's a huge expanse of lawn. Like, where do you get started exactly on something so big? There's no guidance from the site really in terms of the shapes to make. So if you've got a house like this, what I tend to try to do is respond to the house itself. So to build the garden 10 feet away, but uh, ideally attached maybe to some of the foundation plantings that are by the house. That makes it easier to start. When you've got a shape, uh, space that's this big, it is hard to get started with the rain garden. Um, so to explain what I mean by respond to existing forms, this, I think, picture gives you a really good idea for what I mean. So we've got our driveway arcing around. We've got the gardens here that are close to the, gar uh, to the driveway, and they're actually responding to this tree form right here. We talked yesterday about how we don't want to dig underneath a tree. Well, here's a picture of that tree and or this this garden in plan form. The tree's drip canopy goes basically right along the edge, and the gardens are designed in response to that. And so when you look back at the picture here, there is a connection between these gardens and this tree in a way that looks nice. So that's what I mean by respond to existing forms. It's basically look and see what you've got. Where are your sidewalks? Where are your foundation plantings? Try to make the garden work with that as nicely as you can. That's really a good way to go. Um, the last tip I'm going to give you is texturing. So thinking about the different textures that are in your garden. So if you can have a little bit of turf grass next to your garden, and actually I'll go back because this one shows it. See this turf grass right along the edge? So the garden's not right up to the edge of the driving area. You've got some texture. You've got some turf grass there. Um, and then there's some rocks on the edge there. And then there's plants. Those different textures really help the garden look good. This garden on the right has got a turf grass texture. It's got some gravel. It's got some big boulders. And then it's got this great native sedge, brown fox sedge. It's creating a ground cover texture. This is actually a 100% native plant garden, just as only two species. Um, and it's a texture garden. It looks great. On the left side here, this is a garden at Geneva Presbyterian Church that we installed last year. And it's got the turf grass textures. It's got the mulched area. It's got evergreens. We planted some evergreens, junipers, on the berm area, the high and dry area, to give us some evergreen texture. So all these textures together really help a garden to look good. So even if you don't know what you're doing with planting design, just trying to pick a couple different textures can really help. And if you can start incorporating textures into the garden design process, so boulders, um, turf, uh, it really helps. Okay, so that was my very, very brief discussion of styling um, when we're talking about shaping the garden. We'll talk a little bit more about styling tomorrow with planting design as well. So now we're going to get into digging the garden, all right? In our last few minutes here, we've got about eight to ten more minutes of active lecture and then we'll get to your questions. So digging the garden right here is where the rubber hits the road. We've got this beautiful concept on paper, but how do we actually get this thing in the ground? I'm going to step you through that now. It's not that complicated. Uh, I'm going to show you actually three strategies for getting your rain garden in the ground um, with the idea that probably the third one's going to be what you want to do, but just to give you some ideas for the shapes of rain gardens. So here is strategy one. Um, this is actually from the Detroit Zoo. It's a rain garden that we built last fall. This is the no dig add soil strategy. We could not dig here. The water table was too high. We didn't want to dig down to it. And so we basically just piled a bunch of soil. Um, the zoo had a bunch of soil um, in the reserves. We piled it all around the circumference of these gardens. The water comes in right there from a pipe from the Buddy's Pizza, fills up the first basin, overflows to the second basin, and then overflows off this direction. So this is the, you gotta pay a lot of money to bring in soil and it's a lot of work strategy. Not one I typically recommend for most homeowners. Uh, strategy number two is the big dig Holloway soil. This is Plymouth Township Park right here, before, and, oops. Oh, it's not giving me uh, the, uh, the after picture, unfortunately. Um, so I'll let you use your imaginations. Uh, I think it's actually buried underneath here, but basically just digging out a big hole and hauling all that soil away. Uh, it's, it has, gives you a certain aesthetic, but it's a lot of work to do it. Here's strategy three, the balanced approach. This is that Geneva garden again. Here we dug out a bit in the middle and then we piled all around. So all the soil from this garden is right here in the berms basically. And so it's the easiest way to build a rain garden. You're not dealing with extra soils. You're not working hard to move those soils. You're basically smartly balancing the digging with the filling. To give you a little bit more uh, of a homeowner perspective on that, here is an example from a resident, Brenda Dietrich, who should be on your Master Rain Gardener panel tomorrow. She'll talk about building this garden. She dug out from the center here and then she piled on her berm along the side. And I think she nicely shaped that edge as well. So that's the balanced approach. That's the easiest way to build a rain garden. Um, here, I'm gonna give you um, uh, another way to look at that. So, and this is showing using a line level, basically stakes in the ground, 
a line level across, and that helps you to get the garden level and flat. You start digging on the upslope area here, and then you pile the soil on the downslope area to make a berm. So you can see by balancing your cut and fill, um, you end up hitting the sweet spot, reducing your labor to build your rain garden. And then you can see here the three to six inch, whatever uh, is appropriate for your um, garden, the ponding water level across that flat space. Um, so that is your, your rule of thumb for building a garden. And on um, a slope of about this level here, it works out perfectly well. The flatter you are, the more soil you're gonna have left over. Um, now I'm gonna step you through a little bit more detail. Um, one example of digging your garden. Um, and so this one has got a pipe that's underground coming in. And so one of the tricks if you've got an underground pipe is you want that to outlet above the garden. So step one in this digging process is actually just to remove the soil on top so that you're down to the level where the pipe is coming in. You're gonna wanna save this. This is probably topsoil, probably good soil. You're gonna save it for later. Next, whatever depth you're digging, if you're digging a three inch garden or a six inch garden, we're gonna dig out that next bit of soil, the next six inches of soil to what will be the future bottom of your rain garden right there. This could be topsoil also, so you're gonna to wanna to set it aside in case it's good. Take a look, see what it looks like. Next, we're gonna dig even deeper. Um, and this is gonna to be to allow for amended soil, so compost, uh, and good quality soil in the bottom of your garden. If you're not careful, if you dig the good stuff up from top, what you're left with is junky stuff underneath. So we're gonna dig out an extra three to six inches um, from underneath where the future rain garden bottom will be. And we're gonna use that soil, it's probably junky soil, to make our berm especially. Oftentimes it's more structural, so nice and firm soil, all right? Then we're gonna take some of the top soil that we pulled aside, and we're gonna mix it with compost and we're gonna add it back in so that our bottom space for the rain garden has good quality soil underneath. And then we're gonna lightly compact it. We can do our little rain garden compaction dance. Um, so that way there's not a lot of air pockets and we're gonna try to level it as flat as possible so the water spreads out across that garden space. Then we're gonna add in mulch. Three inches of mulch is typically what we recommend. Shredded hardwood works really nicely. It latches together and doesn't float away. Um, wood chips from a tree trimming company are more likely to flow away, especially in an undersized garden. And then lastly, we plant it. And so that's your process there. And I know I probably went faster than you want, but you can always rewind and take it step by step um, to think through the process for digging out your rain garden. And once you get started, it's not that bad. I think the biggest issue for you is gonna be confidence in your design. Once you're confident in your design, the digging process is really not that bad. Uh, next though, question that people often get when they're done with the digging is what do I do with the dirt, right? So if you didn't quite get that balanced um, cut and fill perfectly, if you do have leftover soil, what do you do with it? The principle I'm gonna give you is the, uh, the time-honored tradition of a berm in the landscape. And uh, I can't say I think this picture on the right necessarily looks good. It looks like something from Dr. Seuss, uh, but it I think shows the principle, right? So many landscaped areas are built with raised areas of soil. So what you can do is if you've got extra soil, think about whether you can make your berm for your rain garden even bigger. Uh, and if you can make it a stylish bermed area, um, you can actually uh, make your garden look all the more sculpted and put that soil to, to good use essentially in your planting. And in that high and dry area, you can put potentially use more traditional plants, whether it's junipers or other upland species. Um, you can add rocks, boulders, whatever you want to make it look good. Have fun with it. Or if you can't do that, if you just want to get rid of the soil, there are ways to get that soil hauled off, right? You can advertise through whatever medium you want that you've got clean fill and you can hope that somebody's going to come and haul it away. Um, I've heard from several of my garden volunteers that this has worked wonderfully for them. I'm going to find out myself because I have about six cubic yards, that's about six tons of soil at my house from the four rain gardens I've been building. I'm gonna find out whether anyone comes to haul it away for me. Um, otherwise, you can potentially talk to a local landscaping company. Oftentimes they want clean fill from their projects. Some of them will provide you, this trailer, for example, came from uh, Bushel Mart, uh, locally here in Southeast Michigan, it holds six yards. Um, it was pretty affordable. It was 75 bucks a day plus $5 a yard. So it cost us about a hundred bucks to haul off the soil from this garden or other landscape contractors as well will oftentimes be able to drop you something off that you can send your soil away. Um, so those are some options to get rid of that dirt. 
All right. I think, yep, that's it. And we are about at time. So we timed that pretty well. So that was day two, sizing and digging your garden, right? So we learned about the 20% rule. You're going to use your Google Maps or just get out there with a tape measure or pace it off, measure the area of roof. And then about 20% of that is going to be the size of the garden you want to get. If you've got clay, going to make it bigger, 30%. If you've got sand, you can make it smaller if you want. Um, and then the reality is, right, we just don't always have that much room. So you make the garden as big as you can, and you plan appropriately if you've got an undersized garden. We'll talk about undersized gardens with plants uh, tomorrow a little bit. Um, so you can pick plants that'll survive in that undersized garden. Uh, and otherwise, you just want to manage the overflow properly. So that's our summary. I'm sure there's going to be a ton of questions because we covered a lot of material today. Tomorrow, if you come back and join us, we'll talk about plants. We'll have that master rain gardener panel. Um, and so we can dive even deeper into how to build that residential rain garden and what plants are going to look great in it. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to wrap it up for today. So uh, before we get into the questions, just a reminder about the door prizes. Um, here is the link, the rouge.org slash door dash prize dash D2. If you go to that link, you can fill out the workshop evaluation and get the link to register to um, be entered into the drawing for the door prizes, that rain barrel and the consultation with me, uh, the virtual consultation. So thanks again once more to our sponsors, Pure Oak and Water and the City of Southfield. And uh, without further ado, I'm uh, very pleased to take any questions from the audience. We've got till one o'clock uh, is gonna be when the webinar shuts down. So we've got 30 minutes for any questions you've got. Uh, Laura, do you, are, are you still there, A, eh? and uh, are there any <laughs> questions queued up for me? Oh, yeah, that was great, Matthew. Um, I think we have a lot of excited uh, future rain garden designers here. Perfect. Uh, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Tamiko asks, are you available for hire, or do you have a reference on who can help us create a rain garden? So, Laura, you broke up for the last bit. It sounded like, am I available for hire or do I have references for who to hire? Was that the yes. second part? All yes. right. So I would love to be available for hire. We are working on that business model for that, for what the costs would be. Um, we like to do the idea of a workshop format so people can learn while they're building. So I'm hoping to offer that as early as next year, but right now we don't have that together for you. At our website though, the rouge.org slash rainsmart, we have a list of rain garden professionals. You can find, um, I think we've got about eight or nine companies on there that are willing to build a rain garden for you. Uh, and we definitely recommend, we don't vouch for any of them in specific. So call around, uh, get multiple bids and find out which one fits with your budget, your style, what's gonna work for you. We also list uh, nurseries on there where you can find plants for rain gardens as well. So check out the rouge.org slash rainsmart. That is meant to be your one-stop shop for basically any question you might have coming out of this. Uh, and I actually will mention that there is a link on there to our Facebook group where you can go and um, ask further questions and even post pictures of your in-progress rain garden and get advice from uh, past master rain gardener graduates uh, and from me as well. All right, Laura, what's our next question? Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I will post the link to ra the RainSmart page in just a minute. Perfect. Um, in the meantime, um, Sheila is curious, um, and you touched on this yesterday too, but it's a great reminder. Um, she asks, what about in-ground sprinklers? Mm. Um, or we could even just say any utilities. Whatever. Yeah. So in-ground sprinklers are, are an adventure, right? So I'll do the utility disclaimer first, which we, we discussed yesterday, Miss Dig 811 always call it before you dig so that they'll mark the underground utilities. Um, and if they are wrong with what they mark, then you are not liable if you nick one of their utilities. But if you do not call Miss Dig and you nick a utility, then you have a very expensive mess on your hands. So definitely call Miss Dig, find out where those utilities are. But the thing that Miss Dig does not mark is they do not mark your sprinkler systems, right? Um, they also will not mark internal lines. So once it gets to your house from the street, Say you've got an electrical line going from your, your box to your garage, for example, they are not responsible for that. So you, you wanna try to have a sense for uh, what's happening on your property as best you can. Um, the reality is <laughs> nobody ever plans their irrigation systems with my rain garden goals in mind. So uh, I have nicked irrigation systems on a number of my rain gardens. And so if you know you've got that, you're basically gonna wanna be ready to go to repair those lines. Oftentimes, 
you know, we dig down deeper than those irrigation lines are, and then we end up adding soil back in about to the irrigation line depth. So it can end up working out to still have the lines in the rain garden. It's really just a question of the process of digging and avoiding nicking it. Or um, let's see, so one of the gardens I did last year, uh, the homeowners wanted to repair it. They got it back to functioning. The other one though, they hadn't used their irrigation system in five years. They lived on crazy clay soil and their garden never dried out as a result. They thought it was the dumbest idea ever that an irrigation system had ever been installed on that site. It had no purpose whatsoever. So you might consider whether the irrigation system even still has value. Can you retire that irrigation system? Is it actually helping you in any way? Um, the reality is right, you know, water is precious. And I think that there's value in you know, being a leader on your block and showing your neighbors that you know, it's okay if grass browns in the summertime. It's what it does. It goes dormant in the summertime. It comes back in the wintertime and it looks great. A dormant garden is a sustainable garden. I, I think it's a, a strong value statement to let your grass go dormant. So I actually would encourage you all to nick away, nick those irrigation lines, have fun, um, and uh, you know, just make sure to shut off the water to those irrigation lines. So after you nick it, uh, it doesn't create a problem with leaks. <laughs> All right, that's my long answer, Laura, to that question. That's a great answer. I'm imagining some serious fountains in people's yards from the Yes, right, water features. We're building water ah, features here. There you go, very <laughs> <Pizzazz>. soon. <laughs> uh, we have a great question on Facebook Live from Debbie. Um, and I'd love to hear your answer as well. What is the average cost per square foot to build a residential rain garden? Great, yeah, that's a wonderful question. So reviewing the last presentation uh, yesterday, we showed some information about typical costs. So definitely refer back to that. I'm gonna see what I can do from memory here. If you're gonna DIY it, it can be free. Um, it, you can get all the materials potentially from other gardeners. If you've got friends who are gardeners in terms of plants, you can get the mulch from a, a tree trimming company. You can get the compost from your city for the most part. Um, or if you're paying for those supplies for a typical residential garden, like two, 300 bucks, something like that is, is pretty typical. Um, but you can spend more than that, right? If you are aiming for a specific aesthetic, if you're trying to bring in uh, like stack flagstone at some of the gardens we did last year or um, boulders or, or what have you, you can make it more expensive to meet whatever your aesthetic preferences might be. If you're hiring it out from someone, um, sometimes you'll just hire out the digging, right? You, maybe you'll design it yourself and you'll just get somebody to come in and dig it for you. And I think we see like six to ten dollars a square foot something like that for digging prices can vary widely um so that's just really a ballpark rule of thumb and then if you're uh hiring someone to design and install it do a complete turnkey uh process for you then it really also it varies very widely 15 to 20 dollars a square foot can cost that high although i believe some of the designers that we have on our website can be much less than that as well um, so there's really just a wide variance in terms of what those costs might be. And your site is going to dictate it a little bit as well, right? It's a lot easier to dig in sand than it is in clay and, um, and really the size of the garden itself. Uh, I hope that gives a ballpark rule of thumb on what some of the costs you might expect are. And then feel free to check out yesterday's presentation to get a little bit more talk about it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so we have a, a, some great questions coming in. Um, Ray Tejada asks, can you have a berm in the middle of the rain garden as opposed mm. to around the circumference? Um, and then continues with tree roots are a problem. Does cutting some of the small roots damage the tree? So those are some great questions. So, uh, and Ray, it's actually, it's great to hear from you. Uh, I hope uh, that you're doing well. Uh, so the berm in the middle of the rain garden, um, you absolutely can. And actually uh, the garden that I showed today, I wonder if I can go back to it, with um, the, uh, the church, Geneva Presbyterian Church. That was a three tier, here we go, three tier rain garden. So there's a berm and an overflow to a next level here, and then a berm and an overflow to the next level. So this is really one big garden and it's got one, two berms in the middle of it. So this is an example of where you might have the berm in the middle of a rain garden. Um, if it's in the middle though, right, it's not gonna be doing, it's not necessarily gonna be doing much structurally 
for the outer edge, the lowest point of the rain garden is gonna be where you probably wanna have a berm to be able to hold water back. So if you're doing a berm in the middle of the garden, you know, worst case, it's just gonna be artful if you're designing it to look very nice with that berm there. Um, best case, it's providing a function like this where we're creating multiple tiers as we go down a slope. Uh, so so those are, that's how I think about the, the berm in the middle of the garden. And then your second question was about tree roots. And that's hard to answer in the abstract. The reality is that different tree types have different tolerances to root cutting. Um, and for anyone that has a, a, that needs to see it, I actually do have a guide from, I think it's from Penn State that lists different tree species and gives you pretty precise guidelines in terms of, of how much drip canopy space you wanna leave for the trees. Um, so one extreme silver maples are about the most tolerant. The reality is you pretty much can't kill a silver maple. Uh, the only question is gonna be, um, what uh, valuable thing does it drop a tree limb onto? Does it drop a tree limb onto your car, onto your house? So you wanna be careful digging around a silver maple. You're not gonna hurt the tree, but uh, you could cause some damage if you're not careful around those tree roots. Uh, the other extreme um, black walnut trees especially, you really don't even wanna come anywhere near their, um, their drip line. They're very susceptible to digging under their canopy area. And so that drip canopy is really a rule of thumb. And it's really gonna be, you know, as you're digging, you know, how big are the tree roots that you find? If you're finding little roots and you're gonna find little roots, you'll always find little roots. Those are gonna be okay. It's when you start getting into larger tree roots that I start to get concerned. And so you can carefully test dig within the drip canopy. If you find some of those big roots, then that's a sign for you you don't wanna be digging in there. Um, but it's quite possible that you'll find an area nested um, actually within the drip canopy where you don't find big roots. So you might be able to sneak a garden in a little bit closer, um, but that's gonna take test digging and it takes a lot of work to test dig, right? So if you can just design outside of the drip canopy, that's gonna be the easiest way for you to go about getting your garden in place. Um, and if you've got a tree that is old or sick, um, especially those are the trees you really don't want to be digging at all within the drip canopy. They need every root they've got just about. But if you know, sorry, I'm, one more thing, Laura, if you know that that tree is going to die in five years, maybe it looks unhealthy, you've got an arborist out, I would just make a five-year plan basically uh, for when that tree is gone to think about replacing uh, a rain garden in that space afterwards and replanting a tree adjacent to the rain garden so you can have a tree growing again um, and maybe focus on a different rain garden space if you can for right now. All right, Laura, I'm done. Oh, I'm glad you kept going because you may have just answered Nicholas's question, which is... Right. Um, would you in any circumstance uh, purposefully plant a tree in the rain garden? Um, mm -hmm. and, and Nicholas wonders, does it just have to be the right tree? Yeah, so it has to be the right tree, the right soil. So there's, there's some trickiness to it. Um, but it is absolutely possible to plant on the bottom of a basin. I'm actually going to go back, I think not too far. There here, this picture right here, this is Acer rubrum, red maple, native tree. Um, three, four of them planted in the bottom of this basin. And this is a roadside basin in the city of Ann Arbor. So it's getting the most polluted runoff that it can get. Uh, and it's doing fine, right? These trees are doing okay planted on the bottom of the basin. So you basically just have to pick the right tree that can survive those bottom conditions. The reality though is that probably the tree is going to have a shorter lifespan planting it in the bottom of a basin, unless you've got sandy soils. If you have really sandy soils and the water soaking in great, then you plant away, plant on the bottom of the basin. All you want, the tree's going to do great. If you've got heavy clay soils, the tree might struggle a little bit. You can try to be strategic and plant a tree that's got a strong tap root. That can help actually improve the drainage in those heavy clay soils. But if you're dealing with those heavy clay soils, the reality is going to be you're probably going to be better off if you can plant in the upland area right next to the rain garden or maybe on the side slope of the rain garden so you're not on the very, very, very bottom of the rain garden. That's gonna be a better place to plant the tree probably. Um, so those are my rules of thumb for you. But I love, I love to see trees planted in conjunction with a rain garden. Trees are adding so much stormwater value. They're adding such habitat. They're shading your home. They're cooling your environment. They typically raise your property values by $10,000 um, over their lifespan. So many wonderful reasons to plant a tree right now. So I love to see them planted in conjunction with a rain garden. Um, I hope that uh, catches uh, Nicholas's question. 
Thanks, Matthew. And I, and I would just add to that, there are certainly trees that can tolerate being submerged in water. They can tolerate those anoxic conditions um, and recommend the Morton Arboretum. They have a great tree picker. Um, and then keep in mind, your tree is gonna grow. So whether it's adjacent or in your rain garden, that canopy is going to uh, expand over time. And um, you may start off with uh, sun plants and have to go to shade plants. Um, and I guess we'll probably get more into that tomorrow. We will get a little bit more into that tomorrow. Absolutely. And those are great points, Lara. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, there are trees that can handle being underwater all spring, right, in floodplain conditions. So there are absolutely trees that can survive on the bottom of a rain garden. All right, Lara, do we have any other questions today? Yes, we do. Um, and I will try to include that link in just a moment. Um, Ryan Murray asks, um, actually, the picture you have up, oh, you had up of the easement. Up. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> of, uh, let's see, the easement plant uh, planting with the mm -hmm. um, sedge. Yep. Um, wood hell strip or easement um, planting seven by 10 feet be an okay location for a small full sun rain garden? Absolutely. I mean, in general, absolutely, right? Um, there's always the specific details of you know, sizing it, digging it, what are, what are the soils like, um, all that kind of stuff. Um, and really where the water is going to be coming from in that hell strip garden, right? If you're just getting the water from the sidewalk, into it, then that's super, super easy. It's not typically gonna be that much water. You don't have to dig a very deep rain garden in that case. Um, so there's not gonna really be an issue then. If you are going above and beyond and tackling that street water, and I'll see if I can go back to that picture. Um, if you're tackling that street water, which as I mentioned is the most polluted water um, that's out there. So here's a, a roadside hell strip garden right here. Then you are doing an incredible service for the rouge because you're capturing the pollutants from the car, you're capturing the salt runoff as well and soaking it up. It's more tricky to do that kind of hell strip garden. Um, you're going to have to talk to your community. Uh, they own that property and you're going to need to get their permission for it. And they're probably going to give you some guidelines in terms of what they want it to look like to make sure that it is safe. Um, for drivers nearby, uh, for pedestrians as they're getting out of their cars so they don't fall off a cliff into uh, maybe a 2D rain garden. So there's going to be some guidelines that they give. The other trick for a hellscape rain garden is going to be, and this is getting into what is, I haven't made it, rain gardens 201, rain gardens 301. I don't even talk about this in the master rain gardener class. So this is, um, this is advanced rain garden design right here. But the reality uh, for a roadside rain garden is you're gonna get a lot of sediment. Um, so it's basically like sand and junk. that's gonna wash into your garden space there. And so the term I'm gonna give you is sediment trap. So if you're building in that area, it's gonna be good to try to build a sediment trap. If you're doing this, talk to me because I will give you lots of pictures and we can try to figure out something that's gonna work for you. I wanna see more roadside gardens and I wanna help you build one. Um, but that is gonna be the key. We wanna have a sediment trap, ideally taking that water and we're gonna to have to do a curb cut to cut the curb to let the water come in. Um, if we can do all those things, then these are really about the best gardens that you can have. But it's again, the reality that I expect from most residents is that this is going to be an advanced practice and not something that I'm going to expect that you do, certainly not for your first rain garden, let alone your second or your third, right? Maybe I'm dreaming here. Uh, it's, it's a much more advanced rain garden, and you're probably going to want to have help to build something like that. Uh, I think I answered that question, but uh, feel free if, you, if I miss something to, to follow up with me on that with additional questions. Thanks, Matthew, um, and great questions. Uh, do you have time for a few more? We've got 12 minutes, yeah, go right ahead. Great, okay, uh, Paulette, and welcome back, Paulette, had a um, question, she's got uh, septic tanks. Um, hey, a couple yeah. of tanks um, with the tank lids spread apart about 15 feet. Indeed, okay. Could she put, um, and, I, and I'm not that familiar with septic tanks. Um, you may have to correct me, Paulette. Uh, could she put a rain garden in the area inclusive of the septic tank lids? You missed the inclusive of the septic tank lids is what I heard. So I would really almost need to see the site to just have a sense for where things are at. Um, but Paulette, the, the general rule, rule I'm going to give you is you don't want to put a rain garden on top of a septic field, 
right? So where the, you know, the leach field is located, where the water is going out and soaking into the ground, adding a rain garden on top of that, a, a septic field is a very you know, precisely tuned um, system designed to basically filter out um, all the nasty stuff out of your septic systems, um, um, out of the water there. So we're not gonna be contaminating our groundwater. So we do not wanna build a rain garden on top of that. We do not wanna mess with that system at all. That's actually gonna threaten our groundwater health, threaten uh, potentially getting um, contamination into the groundwater system. So no rain garden on top of a septic field. So then in, virtue, in relation to the, the tank lids themselves, um, I am not aware of a reason if, if it's not actually where the septic system is trying to soak water in the ground. I'm not aware of a reason why that would be a bad place to put it, but it kind of gets to the do no harm principle from day one of if in doubt, I would try to find another area because typically there are so many places in this world where we can build a rain garden. Um, I, I, I just very much hesitate to start building a rain garden in a problem area when there are typically so many places that we could be building on. And if at your home, that's literally the only place that you can work on a rain garden, you know, the reality is we don't need everyone to build a rain garden, right? So maybe you can take the course, the Master Rain Gardener course, and maybe design a rain garden for a school or for a community center or for one of your neighbors. Uh, so there's lots of places that you can get it st uh, started building a rain garden, even if there's not a space at your home. And I just, I get nervous about the general idea of building near a septic tank, even if you're farther away from the septic field. Thank you. Um, we, Matthew, changing topics dramatically, um, we've had a couple comments that uh, the day two door prize um, Ooh, is, is not working? Quite set up right. Okay. Yeah, it gives, um, so just uh, take a look into that. And for folks who um, want to enter um, for these door prizes, um, what should their marching orders be? Marching orders are one o'clock exactly when this shuts down. I'm going to fix it. And I'm going to say, give me, give me a little bit of time, right? I'm, I'm not a miracle worker, and actually, I need to get my own lunch after this. So maybe come back at like three o'clock, um, and I, I expect I should have it fixed by then. Um, so thank you very much for your, your patience and understanding with that. I think you're pretty close to being a miracle worker. Um, well, I try. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of you. <laughs> okay, and then this one um, is actually, if you would mind going back. Um, Paulette also was curious. There was a picture, and I guess you have a rain garden that you showed at the beginning, um, and it was on a slide with like totem poles. Totem pole? Or poles, perhaps. Um, it was at the way beginning, and uh, Paulette was curious where it had taken from. I um, think I'm... it passed me by. Before yeah, I I'm past it here. Um... So I, it's kind of funny because I actually have a totem pole in one of my rain gardens now at Park. Um, one of the ceramic studios, one of their students built an actual ceramic totem pole and put it into the garden. But I'm pretty sure I don't have that picture in this slideshow presentation. Um, so I am not sure. It's Moraine Elementary School there. And this is just, that's just an open canvas there. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, what she's referencing in terms of a total. Oh, maybe she's thinking about these. Um, these are all just, uh, it's a fencing system that the Detroit Zoo put in. There's actually, uh, so the berm across the center of this garden is actually designed to be a pathway essentially. So we made that berm do double duty. Not only is it providing structure for the garden, but it's also letting people walk through the garden and then they can view it um, from different angles, see the plants from different angles. And it also let us manage a utility box. There's a utility box right in the middle of the garden. We didn't wanna you know, bury that utility box under a bunch of mulch and have it be underwater for half the year. So we basically tried to just kill, how many birds is that? Three, four birds with one stone. And we designed the berm to go right through the center of the garden, let the utility box be right in the center, create a viewing area. And then the zoo wanted to put this fence in basically so that way nobody would trick, trip on these boulders that are along the edge just to help improve public safety there. So I'm, I'm guessing that's the totem poles that she was referring to. And then maybe tomorrow, maybe I'll show pictures of that park garden that's got an actual ceramic totem pole in it. Um, it was, let's see, uh, she wrote back, she said, I, I think it was at, uh, at the very, near the very beginning, it had a collage of three pictures. Collage of three pictures. Of the, oh, maybe while you're back scrolling, yeah. 
I'll look ask around. Me. Ask another question while I'm looking around okay. so we, we don't. Uh, um, great. Darlene, uh, Darlene on Facebook Live um, lives in the city and um, wonders if it's wise to put a rain garden over city sewer pipe. Over a city sewer pipe. Um, so I'm assuming that's a sewer pipe coming from your home out to the city uh, line, because typically those lines are under the streets. Oh, actually, no, Detroit. Detroit is different. That's right. I forgot. A lot of the Detroit sewer systems are actually in the easements and the alleyways um, and oftentimes are unpaved. So you might actually have a city sewer line there. Um, I am guessing the city is going to, uh, if they were on here right now, they'd say, no, don't do it. Don't plant it there. Um, so many of those sewer lines are, are very old. They've been in the ground for very, very long. Oftentimes they're leaky. They are susceptible essentially. So the city is gonna be, and they, they actually, I think it's an easement that they own. So I think that they would actually have the power to um, bury your garden, rip it up, destroy it, get rid of it if they ever found out about it. So that's one reason not to do it there. Um, but they also would be concerned if any of the, the plants you plant have like deep tap roots or something like that that would reach down to the sewer line, that would create a, a great deal of concern for them in terms of the integrity of that sewer line. And I can guarantee you that for you, you do not want that sewer line to clog up for any reason, right? I think we can all agree that clogged uh, sewer lines are not good. They lead to poop backing up into basements. So I would keep a rain garden far away from that main city sewer line. Um, and then e over your, your home sewer line, right, that's coming from your home into the main feeder line, you can potentially put a rain garden near that. It's just the same thing, though, about watching out for roots um, that are going to be threatening that. You don't want to have roots that are going to be attacking it. But the reality for so many homes, right, is that you've got old clay tiles or, or pipes that are that have roots essentially already intruding into them. And so you're already in the situation where you probably have to hire a plumber to come out every year to ream that thing out. So if you're already in that situation, right, as long as you're not planting something that's crazy aggressive, then it's not really changing the situation to add a rain garden um, on or near your, your home feeder uh, for uh, the sewer line. Um, like <laughs> thinking about my in-laws and thinking about our house, we have silver maples that are attacking our sewer lines right and left. Like it doesn't get any more aggressive than that. So you really can't make that situation worse. So keep them away from the city sewer line, but your sewer line, if, especially if that's the only place you can build it, I, I would be less concerned about your planting one near your sewer line, um, if that makes sense. Lara, what do we got? We got about three minutes left. So just to, to be aware of the time, the webinar is going to just shut us down um, okay. when that three minute time hits. So, right. so we're. So um, Adele asks, um, and we touched on this at the very beginning, and it'd be great to just ref, um, refresh how can people watch yesterday's Rain Smart Lunch and Learn? So it's on the Facebook event. So you can watch it there now. And I don't think you need to have a Facebook account for it, although Facebook loves to prove me wrong about everything. Um, I hope to have it on our YouTube channel by tomorrow morning. Um, I started uploading it this morning at 6 a.m. And by noon, it was still not done. So I had to cancel the upload. So I, I do hope to get it up by tomorrow morning. It is a large file, so it is taking some time. Um, so it will be available. I promise it will be available. If you don't see it by tomorrow midday on our YouTube channel, um, and I will share the YouTube channel to our Facebook page. Um, and I will also include it if you're signed up through email in the reminder tomorrow that goes out with the Zoom links. I will send you a link to the recording if I'm able to get it available at that time. Oh, Matthew, it might be the, sorry, this is it, the, everyone's um, so kindly and, and sweetly chiming in and they're guessing what slot that Paula is curious about. And I think it might be of Rouge Park. Rouge did, Park. You Rouge, did you show Rouge oh, Park at the very beginning? Yes, I was looking for a rain garden. And so, yeah, yeah Rouge Park, right there's, look at the totem poles right there. Yeah, so that's not a rain garden, that's Rouge Park, uh, as our astute audience pointed out. And this is a picture from Rouge Rescue, obviously not this year, uh, but I believe from last year. Uh, we typically get about one to 200 people out to Rouge Park in a normal Rouge Rescue year, out doing all manner of uh, maintenance and upkeep at the park um, to improve the quality of the natural area, habitat value, to improve the trail systems. So that's what that's showing. That is not actually a rain garden picture. And that was my, my mental disconnect. Like, you know, if it doesn't have a rain garden, I don't see it. 
<laughs> that that's wonderful and it's um much appreciated Absolutely. so I, that wraps up all the questions so i'll <laughs> just turn it back to you what a great audience then because we are at time you all are just perfect in your timing for your questions I'll, I'll just wrap it up and thank you all so much for participating in day two this is day two uh join us tomorrow day three at noon and we will dive deep into plants uh, the final education piece of rain gardens 101 and we'll have a panel of real live master rain gardeners who have designed and built their own rain gardens um, who will share their experiences with you. Um, so join us tomorrow. In the meantime, have a wonderful rest of your day. I will fix the um, door prize entry event uh, feedback system uh, by three o'clock today is gonna be my goal. So come back at that time. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks again to our sponsors, Pure Oakland Water and the city of Southfield. I will see you all tomorrow. So long. Bye. <laughs>